This week, I was going out to lunch just by myself, because sometimes you just need to buy yourself lunch, especially when you got little kids, and you just need that little fringe of sanity, and it was one of my favorite places in Seattle. I won't name it, but it is one of those places that has one, count it, one parking spot. That's it, one. One on the kind of the side of the building. If you know about it, you know about it. It's on kind of a side street. It has one spot. And it was a long day, but you know what? I said, Lord, maybe you are faithful, and maybe it is there for me. Come on. I'm a man of God. I've been reading my Bible. I've been praying some. It should count. It'll be there. It'll be great. Wouldn't you know it? I pull into the street, and there it is, like a ram in the thickets, the one spot set up for me. Like a good, safe driver, I put on my left blinker, and I'm already tasting the food that I wanted. And I decided this time I'm going to be extra safe because I could have made it, but there was someone coming the other direction. And I said, I'm not in a rush. I'm going to let them go. I already got a prime spot. I don't got to worry about it. And uh, some of you already know what's about to happen next because you've lived in this city as well, is that person decided to just swoop right in my God-ordained spot, right there, right in front of the building. And in that moment, I promise you, it happened like it was slow motion. I raised my hand to honk my horn, listen, and, uh, and I got my hand hovering right above the horn. And there's that moment inside where you're like, it's not a big deal. It doesn't matter. You shouldn't do it. And everything was in you. It was like, where is justice though? If you don't, if you don't tell them, nobody's going to tell them. And come on, like, I, come on, we got to serve justice. And there's a slow motion moment. And I could have, and I could have laid it on. I could have whatever, but I gave it the quick, like, beep, beep. You know what I'm talking about? Like the quick, not like, no, 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 not long, just the beep, beep, just to let them know. And then when they turned, I gave them the, you should feel ashamed of yourself shrug. You know the, come on. You knew I got my blinker on, like you know what you did and whatever. And my heart broke. You guys listen. Everything within me said you shouldn't have done it because what turns to greet me is the saddest face of this elderly woman who did not see me, obviously felt horrible, is trying to put it in reverse. Her husband's in the driver in the passenger seat, like telling her you should feel horrible. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And like I didn't, no, 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 no. And of course, guys, of course, of course. It, it, like, it only gets worse. I park like 10 yards further away. Like, it's nothing. It's not a big deal. As I park the car, I feel horrible. And then eat to make it worse, what dawns on me, which you guys, if you're smart, have probably already traced ahead, is I'm about to have to get in line to order right behind them. Like, in the, like we know each other. We saw each other only because I honked. Great idea. And and we're about to stand in line. I walk in, and they're like, I'm so sorry. They're overly apologetic. And I'm like, you guys, I'm just the worst person. I shouldn't have honked. It is a dumb thing. I am so sorry. And it was just this awkward, sad moment. You want to know why we did that? Because I do the things that I don't want to do, and I don't do the things that I want to do, and I hate it. I just I live in this tension that you live in, too. And we want to win. We want to succeed. But for some reason, we just continue to undermine it with our choices. And the worst case scenario is that we start winning in an area that, well, we never even intended to, that we never wanted to, that was never our goal and desire, but somehow through some means we started to be successful in a way that, well, uh, we never really aimed for. Winning in life is challenging. In, in sports, it's pretty discernible. In sports, you can see who has more points. You can see who's successful, who's doing well, what their record looks like. In a race, you can see who is faster and who is slower. It's easy to decide. And we assume, because it's easy to see in a lot of other areas of our life, that it's going to be easy to know if we're winning in our own life. And unfortunately, for many of us, we can feel like we're winning, but Oftentimes, it's not until we realize we're not that it's a little bit too late to change things. And so making sure that we're discerning the win. And for some of us, this can look different. And for each of us, I believe God has a different, unique win. But for many of us, they're going to land under the same umbrella, especially if you're a follower of Jesus. It's so important. That's why the Apostle Paul, he came after Jesus in the Bible, after Jesus' death and resurrection. He became a follower of Jesus himself. He was very anti-Christian, which maybe is a place that you land yourself in here. Maybe you're skeptical or questioning. You would love the Apostle Paul in the Bible. But he has this miracle transition we don't have time to talk about today, but gives his life to Jesus and starts planting churches all around the Mediterranean Rim. He writes this letter and he talks about what it will mean to win. When all intents and purposes, before he was a follower of Jesus, he was winning by cultural standards, by a lot of other standards. He was successful. He was smart. He had status. He had prestige. He had money. He had all the things that you or I would typically hope for. But he decided that maybe winning looked like something else. And he gives us this beautiful illustration to really tell us 
what it can mean to win today. And if you're here and you're wondering, man, maybe I don't feel like I'm in a winning season or maybe I am aiming for the wrong thing, today could be a day that really starts to shape what it means to follow Jesus and win. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. As simple as this sounds, he uses this incredible illustration that he's going to continue to unpack for us a little bit more. But what he's really telling here is all of us are running towards something. We're living life. You got out of bed today. Congratulations. If you're watching online, I mean, less congratulations, but you still made it here. So way to go. You you at least logged in. (laughs) That's awesome. But for those in the room, you got out of bed, you got some clothes on. Everyone looks clothed. That's awesome. It's an accomplishment. Not that that's rare here at Ballard Church. If you're new, we usually come clothed. But, uh, But we all made it. Come on, we're all winning. We're all moving forward in one way or another. And we're all running. But are you winning the prize that you really want? Are you winning in the area that you really want? Because here's what I know to be true. I've talked with a lot of people. And really, through some time of introspection, I've come to realize that when I'm left to my own devices, when I let the gravitational pull of my heart decide what winning looks like, if I don't pay attention to it, and let's say I put it on autopilot, my version of winning— Maybe it's not something I'm proud of. It's not that it's not noble. It's not that it's not great, but it's just not something that maybe Jesus would want to. Now, don't judge me on it because I'm going to tell you, this is what I think my version of winning. If I don't pay attention to it, if I just let it happen on my own, maybe you would recognize this. Maybe yours looks a little bit different, but I would challenge you. Start thinking about it. What does winning look like when you're not paying attention? For me, winning equals my life gets easier and I'm liked by others. That's it. Don't look at me. This is a grace, grace environment, okay? Like some of you are like, whoa, sinner. Yeah, you are too. It's great. Um, my life gets easier and I'm liked by others. I think winning is when my life gets easier, when I have enough money and it's easy. I can go on that vacation. I have to think about it. I can go to that dinner. I can do that thing. I can just spend and not really think about it. That means my life gets easier. When my kids listen, I don't have to ask twice. My life gets easier. When I get my way before anyone else gets their way, my life gets easier easier, when things get easier, when there's no traffic, my life gets easier and I feel like I'm winning. When I'm liked by others, if I'm honest, when people affirm me, when, I, when people um, uh, like what I have to say, when people listen, when I talk, those kind of things, man, those are my ideas of winning. For some of you, it might be when you achieve something, when you're successful, that's what a win looks like for you. For some, it's when there's no conflict in life, that's what winning looks like. For others, when you're seen as important or, or, or creative or wise or smart, that's your win for you. Man, I'm winning in life if people look at me and say, that is a smart individual, that's my win. And, and if you're not a follower of Jesus in here, here's what I'll tell you, this is okay. This is probably normal. In fact, there are a lot of books written out there about how to make your life easier. No one goes, wow, those people are horrible. It's awful. No one says that. There's a lot of books out there about how to be liked and how to get this self-esteem and how to get this affirmation and how to tease it out of other people. There's tons of stuff about that. But what gives me pause, what checks my heart and my goals is that as a follower of Jesus, this is never what Jesus aspired to. Jesus never said, I hope my life gets easier. In fact, he made a lot of intentional choices that it didn't get easier. And Jesus never settled for being liked by others. He never sacrificed truth, but led with grace. It was just this unbelievable tension. And there were many times where uh, people said, Jesus, man, I'm over what you have to see. In fact, one time Jesus spoke a message in his hometown. After he got done, they tried to run him off a cliff. I mean, I've never spoken that bad of a message. That's crazy. None of you guys, maybe this today's the day, but none of you guys have said, man, I want that guy dead after today's message. That's never happened before. But Jesus said, yeah, I can't sacrifice truth and honesty, that winning may look like something, but one note scared me the most about my autopilot win is that all was about me. It's about what am I getting out of this? It's what what am I being served by? How is everyone else being used to make my life better, easier, and more affirmed? And I know, guys, I'm just trying to be honest here for a moment. And if, if you were to be honest, and if your win looked about you and nothing outside of you, then we might have missed the win that Jesus had talked about, that maybe, just maybe, the words of Paul are real. And the fact that we're all running a race, but we may not be running the race to get to the prize in which Jesus intended. We might be running to a victory that is ultimately hollow, to a success that never really satisfies. And man, I'd be a terrible pastor, and I think um, we'd be wasting our time together if we just said, you know what, you do you. I think Jesus has something so much bigger at play for each and every one of us. Here's what we see as we continue on 
in Corinthians, this is what Paul says, everyone who competes in the games, they go into strict training. They do not get a crown that will last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. That, G, that Paul kind of juxtaposes earthly success with God-oriented heavenly success of what it would look like to win on a Jesus perspective. Not to say that temporary success is a bad thing. I'm not here to say that. I'm not saying that any of that is negative to strive towards greatness, but, but maybe, just maybe, there's something bigger at play. I think Paul, if we were to dial this down and tease it apart, would warn us of this important point that winning for a follower of Jesus is something that will outweigh the immediate and outlast the temporary. It'll outweigh the immediate, and trust me, you talk to my wife, especially when it, we just put our be- kids down to bed, and it's dessert time, and we can take out the real good desserts, not like the fake desserts that we give our kids, but like the real desserts, you know what I mean? Where it's like, hey, winter, here's one jelly bean, like, help you enjoy dessert. It's like, no, 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 it's a lava cake time, you know what I mean? Like, it's, anybody, Trader Joe's lava cakes? No? No, oh, come on. You're about to see the Lord in a new way with the Trader Joe's lava cake. And come on, it's real dessert time, immediate come on, I am all about immediate gratification. I love those things, but Jesus calls us to something so much bigger than the immediate, something that's fleeting and quickly here, and it'll outlast the temporary satisfactions of our life. I could go through a list, but the reality is, I think maybe you've lived this before. The reality is, I think maybe you even have a list of your own, that if you would begin to to look down some of the goals of your life, whether they're intentional or just inadvertent goals of your life, and you would say, man, are they are they only striving for the immediate and the temporary? Is there something bigger at play? I think Paul would warn us that there's something more significant in line for a follower of Jesus, that it could be something bigger, that it produces something larger in my life. And here's what I know to be true. It doesn't happen on accident. That's why if we go back um, to the same verse, I think if we go to the next one, everyone who competes in the games goes into, what are they going to? Strict training. They're going to strict training. If you, want to, if you want to achieve something that outweighs and outlasts the temporary and immediate, I think we need to get to a place where we begin to, to lean into it. We be disciplined surrounding it. If you've ever had a big goal in your life, I'm not talking the cheap goals that you can just buy or, or win at easily, not something that you're naturally gifted at. If you've, if you've had something bigger than that that you've succeeded in, I was talking to a guy at the gym this week who was, uh, who was running his first Ironman. And uh, I don't want to make quick assumptions, but didn't look like a person who had run the Ironman before. And he said, I have been training, I have been working, I have been grinding because it doesn't happen easily. It's something that he takes work and intentionality. And I'm telling you, if you're here in your faith and maybe, maybe you're a follower of Jesus and your faith has felt stale or stagnant, this could be a call to us that maybe it's time to take action. I say it around here all the time and I hope it haunts your dreams. Spiritual action creates spiritual traction all the time. You taking action in your life will create spiritual traction. So if you begin, if you like you're spinning the tires in your faith, maybe it's time to get down to the strict training and invest time in prayer. Maybe it's time to invest your time and focus in reading God's word and seeing what could come of it. Maybe it takes time, effort, intentionality of serving in God's church and maybe putting others first around you, seeing what happens to begin to deny my own goals and ambitions and instead put my gaze heavenward into something bigger, something better, something more tangible, something that Jesus um, would encourage us all to do. And if we don't do this, I think we fall into the trap that Paul warns us about at the very end here. Here's what Paul warns us about as he closes. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. Because we're all running, but I don't want to run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating an air. What, what a beautiful illustration. No, I strike a blow to my body, to my own goals, to my own ambition, to my own pride, to my own ego. And I take that down and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others... I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Disqualified, a lot of times, I think we read that and we think like in very black and white terms, like I will, what is he gonna go to hell if he doesn't dance these right dance, like heaven is all of a sudden off the table. I don't think that's what it is. But I think he doesn't wanna miss the mark that God has set forth for him in his life. He doesn't wanna win in a way that just feels like superficial winning. Why? Because I think he's done that before and doesn't wanna do it again. That he doesn't want to chase the same thing that maybe he's chased before, that maybe God is putting something new at the table. 
And he could chase something. He could, who wouldn't run aimlessly, but will run with intentionality and direction in his life. And if you're here and you're thinking to yourself, you know what, that's, that's incredible, but um, I don't know if that's for me. Listen, I, this might be strong phrasing. I don't usually, I, I hope this doesn't come across heavy handed, but the Bible would be very clear that we really only get one shot. We get one season. This is like kind of the pilot episode. You get, you get re-upped for one season, then you get canceled. I mean, that's kind of like it. We live in one, you get your 20s, once. You get your marriage once. You get to parent once. I mean, you, you kind of get this window of life, and, and, I, and I don't want to be heavy-handed about it, but I think Paul would say, man, when you, when you keep that in mind, when you keep that perspective, when you only get your career once, how do we leverage it in a way that serves God better than we could have ever asked or imagined, in a way that really doesn't end up hollow, because I think we could talk to a number of people who have climbed the mountain of make life easier and and be celebrated by others and be successful and get to the top, and they would probably agree with Paul's warning that it might just be a hollow victory. You might get to the end and you thought it would, it would scratch an itch that it never ended up scratching. And for many people that I talk to, they get to a place and say, that's all well and good, but if you knew my past, if you knew my season, if you knew what I did, if you knew what I partook in, if you knew the way I was raised, if you knew my background, you wouldn't be saying something like that. And wouldn't you know it, Paul speaks to the exact same thing in the same context of winning. He says this in Philippians chapter three, but one thing that I do, that this is a self-discipline that he has, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is so important. A self-discipline that he has, maybe even a mantra that he has to do consistently, not a choice that he made once, but maybe a choice that he makes daily, is to forget what is behind. And maybe, maybe today you're, you're watching online or you're here in the room and that's the that's the goal that you need to take on. That's the challenge, that's the mindset that you need to have. Not because of your own aspirations, not because of your own ability, but because of what Jesus has done for us, his grace, mercy, and compassion on your life. He gives you the opportunity to say, what is past is past, and what is future could be beautiful. What is behind you is behind you, not because you just earned it or forgot about it, because God is made it right. He is justified. He is, when, when we talk about the word repentance, it literally just means to turn. And in the original language, it means to turn from one degree to another. And for all of us, I don't know what that looks like for you in here, but maybe it would mean turning from our own goals and aspirations towards what Jesus would have for us. Forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead. Why? Because the goal is to win the prize. Because winning, well, winning is better than not winning, right? Winning It's what we've been called to. And I know it sounds uh, like an antithesis of faith. I know it sounds like something that's very opposite of of having faith, but, but it's something that's so prevalent in the Bible because what holds in the balance of us winning as the local church, as followers of Jesus, really even for you winning in your own faith is... It's incredible. It's a relationship with God. It's bringing heaven to earth. It's God's will be done on heaven as it is on earth. In my life, his kingdom come. His goals be my goals. And when we get that, man, I think everything could change. That in just a moment, each of us could change our goal system. In fact, I put it, I put it this way um, on the screen. You are one step away from chasing God's win for your life. You're one step away, that's it. You're one step away from chasing God's dream for your life. And each of us, we here at Ballard Church, we believe each of us have the next right step in our faith. This begs the question, what's your next step? What's the next step for you? Maybe you were born, and on the day you were born, they started reading Bible verses to you. You memorized the Bible by the age of six. You were some prodigy. It was unbelievable. I don't know your background. Maybe you went to Sunday school every day. You never missed a day. You got a million gold stars, and you were just like a super Christian. That's incredible. I believe God is the next step for your life. Maybe you're in here, and this is all brand new to you. This is something that you're still trying to feel out. You have a lot of questions. You definitely don't have the Bible memorized. You've tried to read it a few times, but you quit because you got bored. I get it. And you're in here and you're thinking, I don't know what God would have for me. I promise you, you have a next step in your faith that we'd love to help you take. I don't know what it is. For some, maybe it's just trusting God for the very first time. For some, it's trusting God enough to to set forth your own ambitions and goals and wins and say, God, would you do with it as you please? 
For others today, we get to celebrate because some have made the choice to be baptized, which is, guys, I promise you 100%, this is like my favorite weekends in all of church, I will 100% start crying, and I'm trying to hold it back right now. But there's these moments, there's these moments, guys, it's beautiful when people decide more than just in a fleeting, passing moment, but Jesus, I want you to be the Lord and leader of my life. I want you to be the king above all things. I want you to navigate and direct where I am going. I want to, I want to make a public declaration of a personal faith. And, and maybe for some of you, that's a place where you're in today too. In just a moment, the band's going to come up and, uh, and we're going to close and, and we're going to baptize. It's going to be like a really special uh, moment for all of us. But, but what I want us to realize in this room, what I want us to get is that God has a next step for each of us. That baptism is a beautiful demonstration of, of, a, of a personal faith. And maybe today, some of you are sitting here and you're saying, I don't even have that personal faith. Well, maybe that could be a great place to start for you, for each of us. What would it take to start to reorient the winds of our life to see in a way that God sees us? So I mentioned baptism as a great example. Uh, we have BC 101 after this. Maybe for you, it's, it's leveraging your gifts in order to uh, serve the local church better. I know there's incredible, like the true heroes of faith are in the kids ministry right now, dealing with your kids and my kids. You know what I mean? Like those are the people that God is really near with right now. And they're, they're holding it down for us. They're helping to raise up the next generation. It's a beautiful thing. The people serving coffee, amen. Some of you needed this morning. That's the only reason you got to church is because people are serving coffee this morning. It's it's a great opportunity to see what's next. Maybe you are a musician. Maybe you love tech. I don't know what it is, but, but I would challenge you. This is the weekend. Come on, let's take it. Let's realize and see what the next step could be in our faith. I'm going to explain a little bit about what baptism is like and how we do it here. And, and the best passage that I've found to explain it, so I don't even have to try and make it up. It's just straight from the Bible, is this one in Colossians. It says this, going under the water is a burial of my old life coming up out of it, well, that's a resurrection. God raising me from the dead, just as he did Christ, that the past is gone, the new has come. Come on, it's beautiful. There you were, you were stuck in your old sin, dead life. You were incapable of responding to God. Come on, you're smart people, you're creative people, you've done a lot of great things in your life, but there's some things you just can't muster on your own, and you feel stuck, and maybe that's where you're at today. But God, he brought you alive right along with Christ. Think of it, all sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, the old arrest worn and canceled, and well, that's nailed to Christ's cross. That is what we do in baptism, is people saying, it might be symbolic, but Jesus modeled it, so we think it's, he, was, he was onto something. He called us to do it, so we're just going to listen. And what it is, is, is when you go under the water, the past is, is gone. And you come up reminded that my goals, my idea of winning, my celebration, my mindset, my self-esteem, everything is now shaped by what Jesus does. It doesn't mean that life will be perfect. It doesn't mean it'll be way, way easier. It just means that Christ will be with me in all moments of my life. And that is what we celebrate today. Because here's the reality. You're not going to be celebrated in a lot of venues of life by taking a faith step. And if you can't be celebrated in church, well, where else are you going to be celebrated? So here's what we're going to do. This is like one of my favorite moments. Um, I'm going to invite all of you guys to stand. Just stand for me. It's okay. You got it. You set everything down. It's going to be great. In just a moment, they're going to go ahead and um, jump in the tub here. It's going to be a cool moment. we got a little hot tub here. And you're wondering, I know it's the same question everyone has. Is it warm? It is this time. Yeah, no, it is. In the past, it was frigid and it was awful. <laughs> But now it's warm, so that's, that's exciting news. And uh, in just a moment, they're going to they're gonna jump in. And, and here's what I want to do around here, because this is what we do. This is what we celebrate. This is our culture here, is that when they go under the water, we're all going to be pent up like it's like two seconds left and the winning shot's in the air. I mean, it's just going to be incredible. And when they come up, I want to hear you guys lose your mind. I want, I want the neighbors to call complaints. I want there to think there's something wrong in this place. I want people to cheer and celebrate. Why? Because the old is gone and the new has come.